Now to acknowledge country. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and Maori people, including those present today, and value the importance of their ongoing connection to land, sea, sky and community. We pay our deepest respect to Elders past, present and emerging, and together we restate our shared commitment to advancing Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and Maori health and education as core business of the college. Tonight's speaker is the Director of Gastroenterology at John Hunter Hospital in Newcastle and Deputy Chair of the College Policy and Advocacy Committee. He was previously the Chair of eHealth Committee and the College and sorry, the Chair of eHealth Committee of the College and was a College Board Member between 2005 and 2008. He is trained in both general medicine and gastroenterology and has worked in Newcastle, Darwin and Launceston. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Filippo with his presentation on low value care in GI. Over to you, Dr. Filippo. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, uh, thank you everyone for joining this um, webinar. And um, for those of you who don't know, we actually have people from all over the world um, joining us. Um, so we have um, people living from Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and uh, USA and UK and Singapore as well. Um, so tonight we'll be talking about um, five top five recommendations on low value care in GI. And these are uh, part of the RACP Evolve uh, initiative through GE Society of Australia. Um, so before we go, uh, what is low value care? And Low value care doesn't mean no value in that particular um, part of the care. It is all relative, really. You know, for example, if there's a country in deep economic crisis where even basic health needs are not met, spending 50% of their uh, budget on, say, a bowel cancer screening program would be considered low value care um, compared to what else is required. So, low value care is about um, you know, reducing uh, waste of resources. So better use of resources, also better decision-making, clinical decision-making and better clinical care overall. And that's basically the triad of the Evolve initiative. Before we begin, uh, I thought we'll do some polls just to warm up so you all know how the system works. So another poll, just to get things going. What's your main area of practice? Um, just interested in seeing how many of you are in gastroenterology. The reason, the reason we're doing this is most of the presentation is actually based on um, survey polls and uh, we'll be answering questions and discussing the options. So I really would like this to be an interactive session. It's a shame that I can't see you all. Um, but that's the way this one way webinar is, but you can interact through the chat function. So for this second poll, we've had um, our top result as 50% uh, being in other, 33% in general medicine, 17% in gastroenterology, uh, and no votes for C general practice. Okay. Okay. So, so we got that um, function going, that's good. Um, so let's dive right into the um, talk now. So we're discussing five topics. So the first is based on colonoscopy referrals. So here is a 33-year-old lady who presents with bloating. Her grandmother died with bowel cancer last week. She is quite distressed and concerned about her own risk of bowel cancer. She did have a colonoscopy three years ago when she was having problems with altered bowel habits. Um, and that colonoscopy was normal and she was told that she has um, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so what would you recommend um, at this point? She was led to believe by the doctors looking after her grandmother that all the family should go and have colonoscopies. Oh yeah, I can see the poll results. So Many of you are tending towards reassurance. I think that's quite reasonable. Um, considering she had, I mean, she's 35. So even if you consider that family history significant, um, the recommendation for family history is colonoscopy every five years. So that 
that's out. Um, and usually that starts from the age of 50 or 10 years um, before the uh, index case. And here she's 35 and her grandmother died last week. So you don't even have to ask the age of the grandmother. And you know, it's definitely going to be more than 55. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, reassurance is quite reasonable. Some of you had suggested FABT, and I wondered um, whether that was um, partly because it's been now uh, three years since the last colonoscopy, and you think uh, rather than order a colonoscopy, if you do a fecal occult blood test, and if that is positive, then offer a colonoscopy. If that is negative, don't offer a colonoscopy. I'm not sure whether that's um, commonly practiced that way, but I wonder if it is related to the fact that the patient does have some symptoms like bloating, but then again, she didn't have similar symptoms previously. I mean, we weren't told about bloating, but she didn't have irritable bowel syndrome type symptoms three years ago, and the colonoscopy was normal. So I am sort of curious um, about um, the rationale for suggesting fecal occult blood test. Um, some of you have actually suggested perhaps just go ahead and do the colonoscopy. Um, I guess, you know, at 35, uh, and family history is considered significant if your first degree relatives um, affected under the age of 55, at least that's what the NHMRC guidelines would say. And so that wouldn't count here. And then uh, because it's a grandmother, uh, next thing is her age. Uh, next thing is that she previously had a colonoscopy three years ago. So even if she was, let's say, 50, and if that was her father who had bowel cancer and he was 52, or sorry, uh, if her father had bowel cancer under the age of 55, even then you would say, well, you had a colonoscopy three years ago and that was normal. So you would say perhaps wait another two years because the colonoscopy for family history is every five years unless you, look, unless you had significant polyps, in which case, you know, depending on the size of the polyps and the histology, it may be three years. So when you had a colonoscopy without polyps, repeating the colonoscopy within three years, even if you thought the family history is significant, is um, questionable. Um, but as you can see, like just within the 50 people that we have here, there is variation in practice. And the reason for that is the, the guidelines are so variable from country to country. So if you looked at um, US guidelines, European guidelines, British guidelines, Australian guidelines, there are subtle differences and sometimes major differences. Um, so for example, in US, I would think someone coming with a family history of grandmother having bowel cancer would be considered significant and they would be offered a colonoscopy. Whereas in Australia, you would say, well, that's average risk. So I think what this case highlights is that there is um, there are nuances in interpreting family history and NHMRC guidelines and offering colonoscopy. And sometimes you might end up offering the colonoscopy because of the underlying anxiety of the patient. CT colonography, thankfully, no one's offering. Um, that's good. Now, a second um, uh, referral related. So this is a 50 year old man who's had intermittent rectal bleeding for at least 10 years, constipation um, and uh, colonoscopy two years ago for same reason, that is constipation and rectal bleeding and had two small five millimeter sigmoid polyps and was recommended to have another colonoscopy in 12 months by the previous colonoscopies. And we don't know why, um, because the patient came from another city and patient is now concerned that it's been two years and they were told that they should have a colonoscopy in 12 months. Um, what would you do? Most of you uh, are recommending that you should get, obtain the previous report. I think that's really relevant here. I mean, if you had a colonoscopy two years ago and you had two small polyps and they were small and they were in the sigmoid, they could even be hyperplastic polyps. 
And if they were hyperplastic polyps, there's really no recommendation for repeating the colonoscopy, in which case you would think that the previous colonoscopies was probably going outside the guidelines recommending a 12-month colonoscopy. There are very few situations where someone would recommend another colonoscopy in 12 months. And a common one would be if the colonoscopy was um, affected by poor preparation. So that is the main reason I would be uh, reviewing the previous report because here is a 50-year-old man with rectal bleeding. Well, even though it was for 10 years, definitely it's rectal bleeding, it's a red flag. And had a colonoscopy two years ago, but if that was affected by poor preparation, even though they were only hyperplastic polyps, for example, I would still be concerned and I might still offer a colonoscopy at that point um, because now I have a reason as to why this repeat colonoscopy was recommended. But sometimes, you know, people tell you that they had a colonoscopy and then you find out, you go through the um, previous doctor and then find out that it was not a colonoscopy. It was a, a sigmoidoscopy, it was a rigid sigmoidoscopy, it was a proctoscopy, might even be a bare minima for all you know. So sometimes people tell you things and uh, you couldn't really book a colonoscopy just on the basis that they were told that they, were, they had a colonoscopy and then they, had, they were told they should have another one in 12 months. But sometimes in a busy clinic setting, all of these are not possible. And sometimes people would say, well, if that's what you were recommended by a previous colonoscopies, well, I've got no choice and I'll book you for a colonoscopy. So it does happen that sometimes people do book them for a colonoscopy. And um, reassuring and discharging is reasonable, but I think you've got to be careful that if somebody actually recommended a 12 month colonoscopy, you want to know if there was a good reason. Um, now, so the first recommendation from Evolve is do not repeat colonoscopies more often than recommended by NHMRC guidelines. And it's a 50 page document, so we wouldn't be going through all of those um, various scenarios, but suffice to say for family history, it's usually five years. If you had significant polyps, um, adenomas more than 10 millimeters in size, et cetera, then it could be three years. And in very few scenarios, you might recommend another colonoscopy in 12 months. Um, so it is worthwhile looking through the guidelines. And sometimes, you know, somebody can have a second degree relative, but if you had one second degree relative and one first degree relative of different ages, but both on the same side, then it, you know, it could count as family history. So it is worthwhile from time to time going back to the guidelines. Um, before you recommend colonoscopies. But before you reject um, the referral, get all the facts um, as far as possible. So number two, uh, fecal occult blood testing. Now, I think one of the options in the previous question was fecal occult blood testing. So let's have a look at this. So here is another um, poll. So this is a 21 year old um, young lady with pelvic pain, constipation, um, bowels opening once every few days, heavy periods, painful, was wondering about endometriosis, takes ibuprofen for period pain once every month. No anemia, but had low ferritin. There's no family history of bowel cancer. And for some reason, her doctor decided to do a fecal cell blood test just for the low ferritin and it came back positive. And now the referral is in your um, desk, on your desk, what would you do? Patient is quite concerned. She was told that this is a bowel cancer stool test and it's positive. Would you offer a colonoscopy? Now, if there was diarrhea, I would have offered a colonoscopy because you know, if there's diarrhea, you're thinking inflammatory bowel disease, microscopic colitis, various other options. But constipation alone, the yield of colonoscopy in this age group is very low. So the reason for colonoscopy would be um, because it's now out there. Somebody has done a test. It's, you know, it's a medical legal uh, liability. 
tests and, and the JP who has done the test has told the patient that you've done a bowel cancer stool test, it is positive. And now patient says, well, are you 100% sure that I don't have bowel cancer? If you say so, then I'm happy not to have a colonoscopy. So if you have that sort of conversation, then I can understand the 17% who actually said, perhaps go for a colonoscopy because now otherwise you're taking the blame. So I think the you've got to nip it in the bud like before like you've got to actually stop doing this test because once you do the test, there are certain situations where you end up actually offering colonoscopy. Now, gastroscopy and colonoscopy, I guess because of low ferritin without anemia, although it could well be due to amenorrhagia, but sometimes people can have celiac disease. So a gastroscopy would be useful in terms of doing biopsies for celiac disease. But I think at least in UK guidelines, they would do celiac serology first and offer a gastroscopy and duodenal biopsy if the celiac serology is positive. Um, we will come to the celiac bit um, further down the presentation. Now, pernicious anemia can also cause iron deficiency anemia. So in doing antiparietal cell antibodies would also be a reasonable thing to do. Because I guess sometimes you can have coexisting illness causing iron deficiency. So you couldn't automatically assume that just because someone, someone has heavy periods that the iron deficiency is due to that. I mean, there are people who got mis, you know, misdiagnosed bowel cancer because someone had assumed that it is menorrhagia. So it is reasonable to think outside um, that. Um, some would argue that, you know, considering the person is only young, 21, the chance of this being bowel cancer is low, rather than doing a fecal occult blood test, iron replacement reassurance would have been a reasonable uh, approach without doing the test. But I just wanted to be more, you know, provocative by saying, okay, the test is already done and it's positive, what would you do? You know? But I think in this case, if the test wasn't done, I would have started off with celiac serology. But after, now that the test is done, I would have gone through all the risks and benefits and level of anxiety of the patient and may have sort of, you know, yielded and done the colonoscopy. Second scenario, a 55 year old man who presents uh, with family history of bowel cancer uh, with a first degree relative having bowel cancer under the age of 55. And a colonoscopy was done 18 months ago um, uh, for rectal bleeding and then was found to have hemorrhoids. Recently, patient um, had recurrence of rectal bleeding. And since it's been 18 months, the GP has decided to do another fecal occult blood test. What would you do? Now, it's been 18 months and the fecal occult blood test is positive and the patient has rectal bleeding. This is recurrence of bright red rectal bleeding that patient previously had and was found to have hemorrhoids 18 months ago. Would you offer a colonoscopy? And yeah, some of you uh, are going to offer a colonoscopy and I think it is reasonable. I guess when you have interval positive fecal occult blood test, especially if it is more than 12 months, then you could say, you know, what if this is your only opportunity to diagnose an interval cancer? Because it can happen that you can have a good colonoscopy 18 months ago and then be diagnosed with post-colonoscopy cancer. So it is reasonable to think about that, but it also depends on the quality of the last colonoscopy, who did the colonoscopy, what was the preparation, what was the um, strength of the documentation, was cecum identified um, correctly, was there a good photo of cecum that you would agree with. So I think reviewing the endoscopy report for the quality and documentation, photo documentation, all of that can also help you uh, decide, you know. So occasionally I've been in this situation and it, I've done the previous colonoscopy myself and I've got all the photos and, um, and I'm able to then discuss with the patient saying, look, I've, I've done all of that. I've gone all the way to the ILM. 
we didn't find a, you know even a small polyp the chance of this being due to bowel cancer is really small it's been you know normally i wouldn't have recommended another colonoscopy until five years um and um I know you've done a fecal occult blood test and that's positive, but you know you you were also having hemorrhoid bleeding. Um, it could be false positive. You never know. I mean, I can't guarantee you that it is false positive, and I can't guarantee you that it can't be, you know, interval cancer. But the chance is small, um, considering you are currently asymptomatic, and all of these things. And then I'd say, how would you feel about this? And most people would say, well, you know, I'm happy to give it a miss and have another colonoscopy in five years' time. Then again, it depends as well. Like, you know, when you have those discussions, you can have a patient who would say, look, you know, I've seen my dad die with bowel cancer or with, you know, advanced bowel cancer with a colostomy and all of that. And I would never want to go through that again. And, you know, that kind of level of anxiety that's now been created with a positive fecal occult blood test. Now you can't actually backtrack sometimes. And sometimes you, you may, you know, end up offering the colonoscopy. And I think that's the 17%. But I think most people would uh, review the last report and then decide one way or the other. And, and reassurance and discharging the patient and asking them to come back in three years is quite reasonable. Um, ordering a CT colonoscopy in this setting, I suppose it all depends on uh, um, how the patient feels about you know, having to go through another colonoscopy. Um, a CT colonography you know, may not be, you know, it may not fit the indication for ordering a CT colonography because it's not an incomplete colonoscopy or there are no contraindications for a colonoscopy. But if the patient says, well, I'm happy to pay for it, I'll have a CT colonography. Well, I suppose nothing wrong in offering because it would definitely detect anything more than 10 millimeters. So these are all the options. But once again, we're in this scenario because someone who has got rectal bleeding was actually, rather than looking into the rectal bleeding, decided to do a fecal occult blood test instead, which is you know, the wrong approach in this setting. Um, so evolve recommendations from Australia say, do not undertake FOBT in patients who report rectal bleeding, iron deficiency, or other GI symptoms. Now, you may have seen this um, great study from UK where they've looked at um, the yield of um, fecal local blood testing in symptomatic patients. We don't recommend that in Australia, but the, study from UK where, where they looked at people presenting with colorectal symptoms, including bright red rectal bleeding, iron deficiency anemia, altered bowel habits, and found that even in that kind of a high-risk group, negative fecal occult blood test has a very high negative predictive value. So there is an argument out there saying, perhaps you could risk stratify those presenting with colorectal symptoms based on fecal occult blood tests. But I think that would be a wrong approach in our setting where, you know, if someone has rectal bleeding and iron deficiency anemia and you do a fecal occult blood testing and find that it is negative, and as a result, you decide, you reassure the patient falsely that, oh yeah, your fecal occult blood test is negative, then that would be wrong because you actually presented with rectal bleeding and iron deficiency anemia and you missed out on a colonoscopy for which you were eligible based on those symptoms, based on a negative fecal for blood test. So uh, our recommendation in Australia is don't use fecal for blood test in symptomatic patients who already have a good indication for a colonoscopy so that you're not unnecessarily delaying their colonoscopy by ordering a fecal for blood test and waiting for the result or falsely reassuring them based on a negative test when they have colorectal symptoms colorectal cancer symptoms. So yeah, but too often the test has already been done and we are at the receiving end of making a decision. Now the third um, low value care issue is long-term PPI. You've all seen um, the number of people who are on PPI. In fact, someone called it the national breakfast PPI because that's how many people are taking PPIs in the morning every day in Australia. You know? So patient on PPI, this is a 32-year-old obese lady with reflux symptoms, is a non-smoker, had a gastroscopy last year for reflux symptoms. It was normal apart from a small hiatus hernia. She drinks a liter of Coke daily, 
also takes PPI twice a day and the symptoms have been under good control, hasn't tried to reduce the dose because she's worried about breakthrough symptoms. What would you do? She wants another prescription. Would you repeat? Would you send a repeat prescription? Would you reduce and the dose and wean PPI to see if the symptoms might settle down? Would you recommend lifestyle changes and simple antacids and stop the PPI altogether? Or refer to pH and manometry and refer for anti reflux surgery? Eighty percent of you um, are recommending lifestyle changes, and I, I think the twenty percent who recommended reducing the dose and weaning PPI, I'm sure they're all thinking C and B. I should have put an option like that, you know. So uh, I think B and C both are good options and combined. So it is important in this setting to uh, recommend lifestyle changes, simple antacids, you know, stopping drinking coke, weight loss. And also, um, these are the sort of patients where I would actually talk to them more about long-term side effects of PPI, um, about you know, unnecessarily taking a PPI and uh, affecting you know, what is a normal process in the body to have acid, which is important for your iron absorption, B12 absorption, for all good digestive system. It is your first line defense and all those kind of good things about acid that they are missing out on. So, I normally recommend that they consider um, weaning and stopping PPI so that they're not taking unnecessary risk of long-term PPI use. And the list of long-term PPI use side effects are endless. You know, some of them are dubious studies, but overall, if you want to make a list, it's from head to toe, there are side effects for PPI you can list. So I think I would go through those things, considering that the benefits are small, there are potential risks and potential costs. Um, so I would go for option B and C. Now, another example here. Now, here is a 65 year old um, lady with rheumatoid arthritis on methotrexate, had been using intermittent um, meloxicam, had a pretty severe duodenal ulcer bleed eight years ago, and had at that time was found to have helicobacter was given treatment, eradicated successfully, and more recently had atrial fibrillation and was started on epixaban, also previously on aspirin for ischemic heart disease and a bare metal stent five years ago, no longer on dual antiplatelet therapy, but definitely continuing aspirin and epixaban, uh, has been taking PPI since the original ulcer bleed eight years ago, but recently started reading about all the various long-term side effects of PPI and somebody mentioned dementia. And since her mother is in a nursing home with dementia, she's horrified about the thought of having dementia, would like to stop PPI. What would you recommend? So here, um, uh, most of, oh, well, some of you suggested um, repeating the gastroscopy and decide, because I think the stakes are really high here. Patient is an aspirin, patient is on an anticoagulant, had a duodenal ulcer, but that was related to helicobacter that was eradicated, um, but has been taking PPI and everything has been under control. And if she really wants to stop PPI, you want to know what is her risk of bleeding, especially because. She's still intermittently using meloxicam. So I would be sort of quite tempted to continue PPI, but we'll be you know, looking at all the risks and benefits in this setting. Well, she's completely asymptomatic and the peptic ulcer was eight years ago. So sort of I think about, you know, do I want to subject her to a procedure just to decide whether to stop PPI, continue PPI, you know? Um, what if the gastroscopy was normal? Am I going to stop? What is the chance that I'm going to do a gastroscopy and find a duodenal ulcer? It would be very small. If she'd been taking continuous PPI for the last eight years and with helicobacter eradicated, the chance of you finding a peptic ulcer is small. But then some of you, like 50% of you who suggested repeat gastroscopy are obviously thinking, 
about this version being on aspirin and intermittent use of melox meloxicam. So it is quite possible that the patient has a currently existing peptic ulcer, which is moderately under control because of her ongoing use of PPI and stopping the PPI in that setting with an existing ulcer would be quite wrong. So I think repeating a gastroscopy is a reasonable thought. Um, if the patient said, oh, look, I don't want to have another procedure, I'm happy to continue PPI, um, is there a risk benefit? I would say it is reasonable to take it as a prophylactic um, while you're still on aspirin and intermittent use of NSAIDs because of the risk of recurrence of duodenal ulcer. So it's one of those rare situations where I might say continue PPI as a co-prescription along with your NSAID, um, but after discussing all those other options as well. I would certainly do another helicobacter breath test and, and uh, if that is there, eradicate as well. Um, so yeah, all of those are good options, but it, it sort of gives you two different case scenarios um, of PPI use where you definitely want to stop, but want to also think about it. So the third recommendation from Evolve, uh, GC recommendations is do not continue long-term PPI without first attempting to reduce the dose and, and see if you can at least reduce it to a lowest effective dose or potentially even cease. But the paradox in real practice is that um, people who really need to keep taking it actually want to stop it. And those who really should stop want to keep taking it. And so it's an ongoing battle, especially with all those PPI papers that keep coming. Um, so that's number three. Coming next to celiac uh, genes. So celiac genes, you all know about HLA, BQ2 and BQ8, they're celiac permissive genes. And you can get a blood test done. It, it is an expensive blood test, but quite frequently done in the community. So here is a 29-year-old uh, male with migraines, no abdominal symptoms, but just having migraines. Has a cousin who has celiac disease. So he requested his GP to do a gene test and the GP did HLA, DQ2 and DQ8. And the result was that patient had celiac permissive HLA. So the patient was asked to go on gluten-free diet and was referred to gastroscopy and duodenal biopsy to confirm the celiac disease. What is your first impression? Nobody thinks this is wrong on so many levels. Um, yeah, I think it, it is tricky. So the patient, is on gluten-free diet, which just really is not the right thing to do. In fact, doing celiac HLA as a screening test itself is really misleading. Considering 40% to 50% of general population actually has this HLA. So there's one in two chance that this patient could have that HLA, but there's only 1% chance of this patient having celiac disease because the prevalence of celiac disease in the Australian community is about 1%. And if you've got the HLA, it's 2%. So it is still not a diagnostic test by any means. And in a person who is currently eating gluten, the first thing would have been to do celiac serology. And now that the patient has started gluten-free diet, I would recommend doing gluten challenge, test TTG, and then decide to do the biopsy. Um, now, I would book a gastroscopy and biopsy if the celiac serology is positive, but if the celiac serology after gluten challenge is normal, I would say, look, you're one of the 40% in the community who have this HLA permissive um, trait, and it may mean that you may have celiac disease in future, you may develop celiac disease in future, but majority of people would go on for the rest of their life, never developing celiac disease at all. So the, there's no reason for you to be on gluten-free diet. And I'm sorry that you had the HLA test done. Now, next, 
this is an 18 year old um, young lady with iron deficiency anemia. B12 level is normal. She's on a vegetarian diet, has irregular heavy periods, has bloating and intermittent diarrhea. Lost quite a bit of weight in the last couple of years. Parents were getting concerned that she may be developing an eating disorder. And she's also put herself on a gluten-free diet, um, partly to reduce bloating and abdominal symptoms as she felt some comfort with gluten-free diet. Gastroscopy and duodenal biopsies were done previously, and that showed uh, mild duodenal lymphocytosis. So they just few intraepithelial lymphocytes, no villus atrophy, celiac serology was normal. What would you do? So, this patient at the time of presenting to you is already on gluten-free diet. Um, so one possibility would be to uh, encourage a patient to um, go back on gluten and then repeat the biopsy, especially because the previous biopsy was mildly abnormal. The um, checking for pernicious anemia is also a good idea, even though the B12 level is normal because uh, one of the early signs of um, antiparietal cell antibodies, pernicious anemia, is actually iron deficiency. So it starts out with iron deficiency and much later with B12 deficiency. So it's one of those um, causes of iron deficiency anemia that is not often thought about. So it's a reasonable thing to do, parietal cell antibodies, because of the low iron levels. Um, this is one setting where I would do celiac gene testing only because patients obviously um, quite happy with the gluten-free diet currently. And every time she eats gluten, her abdominal symptoms are getting worse. You know, it may be non-celiac gluten sensitivity or celiac disease, we don't know, but she's unable to tolerate gluten. So in that setting, forcing the patient to go back on gluten is quite hard. So if you did HLA and if the HLA was non-permissive, then you could say the chance of you having celiac disease would be less than 1%. And then you, whereas if you did the celiac um, HLA and if that's positive, then you might say, look, you know, there's, um, you know, more than twice the chance compared to general population. So it would be worthwhile doing gluten challenge and then repeating the biopsy. So most of you agree, A and B. Um, so when to test HLA? So in this scenario, like we're talking about, Doctor is considering the celiac disease. Patient is already on a gluten-free diet. So ask the patient if they're able to do gluten challenge. If they're not able to do gluten challenge because of their symptoms or whatever reason, then maybe doing the celiac genes in that selective scenario to decide what is the likelihood and then decide whether to repeat the biopsies or not. So there are situations where this test is useful, but just don't do that as a routine screening test. Now, we are really running out of time. I think we're going to in a couple of more minutes. We're on number four. So this number four is do not undertake genetic testing for celiac genes as a screening test. But it is sort of quite widespread in the community. So quite often you're confronted with the test already in the referral. Then you have to now go through all this scenarios in your mind. So last one. Barrett esophagus screening and surveillance. This is one of the reasons for a lot of gastroscopies around the world, especially where um, people are insured and they can have gastroscopies. So here is a 41 year old lady who's a non-smoker recently moved from the city, referred for a follow-up gastroscopy for Barrett's, recommended by the previous endoscopies who did the gastroscopy 12 months ago and found one centimeter barrage. And the biopsy report says, two pieces of columnar epithelium, no dysplasia, consistent with barrage, correlate clinically, and that's the histology. Patient was told that she should have another gastroscopy. And um, you're confronted with this, what would you do? 
Now, all of these options could be potentially correct. Um, so if we just take it on face value, someone had baritosophagus with no dyspicia, you certainly wouldn't repeat it in within one year anyway. So it would say at the most three years. So that means that, okay, so just scope in two years. So C is a reasonable, safe option. Reviewing the histology slide to actually completely dispute the whole idea of whether or not the patient is Barrett is actually, in the long run, is actually a good option because she's only 41 and now you're committing her to gastroscopies um, frequently for a long time. And what if she doesn't even have a Barrett esophagus? So I would review the endoscopy report, potentially the pictures of the endoscopy and uh, the histology and decide, is it really Barrett? And if there was doubt, then maybe I would do a gastroscopy just to clarify whether or not it's Barrett's. And then if it is not Barrett's, then I'll just revise the diagnosis, reassure the patient that you don't have Barrett's and you don't need scopes anymore. You know? um, so all of these options are reasonable to varying degrees. Now, a second scenario. So here is a 56 year old man, obese, smoker, brother had esophageal cancer, and his gastroscopy showed 10 centimeters of um, Barrett's esophagus. Biopsy showed no dysplasia last year and the year before. When would you do the next gastroscopy? And he's got 10 centimeters of Barrett's esophagus and strong family history of bowel cancer. He's 56, obese, high risk of esophageal cancer. But two previous gastroscopies had no um, dysplasia. So some of you recommend one next year. That means two years from the last gastroscopy. Some would recommend it in two years. Some would recommend it in three years. So again, I think this all depends on the scenario, the quality of the previous gastroscopy, who did it, whether you did it yourself. Was it, you know, did they use, um, you know, NDI and other imaging? And did they do a Seattle protocol, which is like four quadrant biopsies every two centimeters? And was it done both times? And all of that, all of those things come into play. And depending on the quality, you might say, well, three years is reasonable. Uh, two years is quite reasonable as well, but two years from the last gastroscopy, especially, and, and in this scenario, whether the histology said columnar epithelium or intestinal metaplasia or goblet cells or not, any of those, I would still be concerned because it's a long segment, 10 centimeter Barrett's. So Barrett's guidelines are actually quite interesting because Barrett's guidelines are different in UK and Australia. Similarly, I think our guidelines are more in line with American guidelines. Because um, say, for example, if you took a biopsy just below the gastroesophageal junction in the cardia, you would get a biopsy report saying columnar mucosa cardiac type. And in some countries that would be reported as consistent with Barrett's mucosa because it's columnar mucosa and you've taken it in the tubular part of the esophagus. Now, Australian definition is quite strict. It says presence of intestinal metaplasia, which means goblet cells within the columnar mucosa, and then only it's paratosophagus. If you didn't have goblet cells, then it's columnar lined epithelium. And if it's columnar lined epithelium, that's not the same as paratosophagus. But if it's a long one, you would still consider that as paratosophagus and still do a three yearly surveillance. But if it's a one centimeter columnar lined epithelium with no goblet cells and no dysplasia, you wouldn't even repeat the gastroscopy and you wouldn't even call it Barrett's in Australia. So it all depends on the endoscopist's visual estimation of where the gastroesophageal junction is. The gastroesophageal junction is in a way the gastric falls in. So during the breathing, as you're checking, you could easily make something that is a hiatus hernia look like Barrett's and then take biopsies. So whenever I hear a short segment Barrett's, I just think about, you know, did they just take a biopsy from the cardiac? 
and calling it Barrett's esophagus. So the definition itself can be tricky. And many people are over diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus, especially when it's one centimeter. So look carefully at the histology report to see if there are goblet cells and um, intestinal metaplasia and the length of the Barrett's and whether they did Seattle protocol and all of that. And then you could be in this scenario where no dysplasia, no intestinal metaplasia, columnar line esophagus, less than one centimeter, no follow-up required, potentially. You know? and, and if it is one to less than three centimeters, we treat endoscopy in three to five years. But this patient, the last second patient we talked about had a long segment. So two to three years is quite reasonable. So understanding what is Barrett's, what are the definitions, the UK definition, American definition, Australian definition, and your pathologist could be following the UK definition because they just moved from England. So always check with the pathologist about what definition they're using. And if necessary, you know, bring it up at the pathology meeting, review the slides and, and address it yourself. Because if you tell someone who thought that they had Barrett's esophagus, that you don't have Barrett's esophagus, that's a weight off their shoulders. And, and a cost to the society. So do not perform a follow-up endoscopy less than three years after two consecutive findings of no displacement from endoscopies with appropriate four quadrant biopsies for patients diagnosed with Barrett's. So there's no evidence for routine screening of everyone three flux to see if they've got Barrett's. The diagnosis relies on endoscopy appearance, so it can be subjective where the junction is, and potentially you could be taking cardiac biopsies and calling it Barrett's depending on the pathologist's definition. So it is overdiagnosed and it's something to watch out for. Questions? Uh, I was just reading some comments there about um, breath test issue when someone's already on a PPI because you've got to stop the PPI, so it's a tricky one. Um, and um, yeah. I think the colonoscopies, whenever we're repeating the colonoscopies, it's really important to look at the previous person's documentation and also understanding that someone else is also going to look at our reports if our patient moves next door. So it's always good to you know, take good photos and document um, all of the landmarks because you may not be the next person doing the colonoscopy and someone else may have to make a decision on the quality of your procedure. Right? So. That's a good point about colonoscopy quality and documentation. Any other questions? There and haven't the... been any received so far. I think okay, that's good. Yeah. I think you've covered all of the points so well. Uh, nobody, <laughs> you've covered all the questions already. Um, so unless if there's any sort of final remarks that you might like to make, otherwise uh, we might wrap up the webinar there for this evening. Oh yeah, so I, I think um, um, just wanted to say there is, quite um, heated discussions about biopsies and Barrett's and everything related to gastroenterology on Twitter. So if you're not already on Twitter, please um, check it out. I mean, I'm on Twitter, you can follow me, but you know, there's plenty of people out there, you know, debating all these issues and polls. So if you found today's presentation interesting, it is an ongoing debate on Twitter. So follow me on Twitter and check it out. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Belipo. Uh, and thank you again for your wonderful presentation. So that concludes tonight's webinar. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us tonight.